dad was always like, oh man, I, you know, I, I don't really like my job very much, but I can't just leave because like, I've got this mortgage to pay. Right. But then when you don't have the mortgage, what's interesting about it, because one big argument I get from people is, is, oh, well, maybe you should be just investing in property or real estate. And, you know, now you can do those things, but nothing stops you doing them even when you've got your mortgage paid off on your home. Like you can do you can do so much more. In fact, your capacity to take risk is a lot higher yeah. and you're doing it from a place of safety. How would you like to own your home outright? What would it feel like to never make a mortgage payment ever again? On our mortgage-free segment today, we're going to interview Ken and Mary Akorafor from London. Recently, Ken and Mary became mortgage-free. Today, we're going to learn how they accomplished this family financial goal and what they're doing with their money now. Welcome to the show, Ken and Mary. Hey. Oh, thank you so much for having us. Thanks now. for having us. I'm glad you guys are here and sharing your story with us to inspire others on their yeah. mortgage-free journey. So thank you very much for doing this. I like to start off the show with the mortgage-free three. These are quick, short answers about your story and how you did what you did. So let's start off with the first one. What was your starting mortgage principal balance when you began your mortgage-free journey? So we paid off a total of about £380,000 or $475,000. Awesome. Thank, and thank you do, for doing the conversion for us. I really appreciate <laughs> it. <laughs> and then the second question, how long did it take you to pay off that amount? It took us seven years. So we had the goal to pay off in 10 years initially, but we were able to achieve it in seven years. I love it. I love it. And then what was the, what is the home value today? And you don't have to share specific numbers, but... Uh, uh, okay. Yeah. It's it's more than doubled in value. More than doubled. That is incredible. That is incredible. Well, congratulations on that accomplishment. Now that we have those numbers and now we know a little bit of the details, can you talk to us about why you wanted to become mortgage free in the first place? Sure. We've got a lot of a lot to say on this topic. So the first tip or the first point I wanted to share really is that it's the peace of mind and mental freedom. So there's a weight that gets lifted you know, off your shoulders when you no longer have a mortgage uh, to worry about. Uh, it brings the type of uh, peace that people can never really explain in words. And you'd need to really experience it yourself to be able to explain it. So that was one of the biggest ones, the mental freedom. Yeah. I think the next one also was financial independence. So it just made financial achieving financial independence much easier mm -hmm. as maybe housing is for most people is one of the biggest costs that you'll pay typically um, or have to worry about. So mm -hmm. when you don't have the mortgage costs any longer, it's like much easier and cheaper to maintain your lifestyle and be, be financially independent. Just to add to that, I mean, we've got quite a number of reasons that really inspired us. One is the corporate career. So we personally didn't want to work till we were 65, for example, yeah. in a corporate setting. But we still love working and wanted to do different types of work. So paying off the mortgage was almost another way to explore an, an entirely different career opportunity but without the fear of trying to do that necessarily. Yeah. And then the next is savings. So we estimated that we conservatively saved an excess of over 100K Um hundred thousand pounds or hundred and thirty one thousand dollars in future interest costs just by actually making just that by move making those pay. overpayments yeah yeah and you know one thing about our story and we haven't had the chance to talk about it but it's worth talking about now is is where we come from an immigrant background i'm a first generation immigrant to the uk mary was born to immigrant parents so another motivation for paying this mortgage off was seeing our parents struggle and effectively over time almost almost become slaves to the mortgage in a weird way and it almost hindered their retirement so seeing them struggle and wanting to do something different uh, was like a you know a big one and they obviously tied to that is legacy for our children and that sort of thing all of the above i love all those answers those are fantastic now being in london since it's a pretty high cost of living area yes. was this a significantly large portion of your household income and and, that, and for that or your household budget i'm sorry and for that reason it made that much more of an impact oh huge um the uk cost of living is very high and london is even more expensive if you live in and around london and, and commute to towns and that sort of thing so um it was a big part of our costs and has increased had in, has increased over time as interest rates began to rise so the Key thing about our journey was that we were paying off our mortgage when interest rates were lowest, um, which is unusual because people are like, why on earth would you do that? Yeah. But it also means that the debt compounds a lot slower, mm -hmm. right? And which means you're paying off 
a greater proportion of capital compared to interest. So for us, it just made sense, but it doesn't make logical sense to a lot of people. Yeah, it's hard to put those emotions and the other things you mentioned, peace of mind into a calculator, right? I don't think that, that, yes. that, don't think that doesn't fit well into a calculator. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so talk to us about the mortgage yeah. pay down process, because I think a lot of people hear these numbers and they say, wow, seven years, that's a, that's a pretty aggressive timeline to do this. Talk to us about the process of paying this off. How did you do that? So uh, we, we, we took a multi um a multi-strategy approach. So the different things we did that added up to the result. So the first is that we made mortgage overpayments. Bless you. So I want to just explain that and what that means in terms of impact. So imagine that you've got a uh, a person who has uh, a mortgage of, let's say, $325,000 over 25 years and with an average interest rate of 5%. When you overpay by a certain amount, it has a different impact in terms of interest savings as well as time that it wipes off the mortgage. So if you overpaid by the equivalent of £100 per month or $130,000 a month, it saves you about $34,000 US in interest and wipes three years off the mortgage. In our calculations, if you overpaid by £500 or $650 per month, it will wipe out 83,000 pounds or the equivalent of 108,000 US dollars in interest and wipes 10 years off the mortgage term and so on. So the more you essentially overpay, the more it reduces the term of the mortgage due to compounding not working as aggressively and the more it also saves you in interest over term. So overpaying was one strategy. What else would you add to that? So we lived on one income and used the other income for mortgage overpayments and paying, you know, into the stock market as well, investing in the stock market. Um, we used our bonus as well and redundancy money. So whenever we got the bonus, we didn't like book holidays. It all went into mortgage overpayments as well as... At least half of it. At least half of it, yeah. We use some of it for fun. Yeah, fun is yeah, important. Yeah. Um, and then <laughs> redundancy money as well that just went straight into overpayments because also we were able to secure another job quite soon after. And we'd also had an emergency fund, so we didn't need to dip into that redundancy pay. Starting side hustles were pretty instrumental, looking for alternative ways to earn an income using your existing skills or any new skills you've acquired. So for us, Doing that was definitely one thing that helped to boost our income. We also made two payments a month as a way to um, uh, effectively make more payments in a shorter period of time, thereby reducing the impact of um, uh, compounding. Another big factor was career development. So I did an executive MBA at Cambridge University, and as soon as I qualified, uh, you know, I got through that MBA. That helped massively with my income, you know, rising massively in my career as a chartered accountant. I became a chief financial officer for a venture capital business. And with that came, you know, rises in income, which meant that provided my lifestyle wasn't creeping up, you know, we were able to build a much bigger buffer and then, you know, overpay more on a mortgage and invest in the stock market, which was our approach. But it was one final point about lifestyle. Do you want to speak to that? Yes. Yeah, so we swapped our cars. We went down from two cars to one car. And the one big guzzler that we had, it was a German um, Audi A4. We swapped that with a second-hand electric car, Nissan Leaf. And the running costs of that Nissan Leaf, like literally it slashed the running costs of the car. So we went from spending around um, how much a week when we had the Audi? About £50 or $65 per week uh, to a month of about £30 a month or about $40 a month. That's what ended up being our running cost for just a car. Yeah, yeah, just $40 a month to run a car. And that was many trips that we did, multiple trips in a day, doing a school, school run. run and going to work. Mm -hmm. So also we um, we stuck to a food budget of £50 per week, which was like $65, $65 which is challenging to do. For a family of four. And that meant just shopping in cheaper supermarkets, eating store brand foods, whilst also obviously being healthy, um, maintaining that healthy lifestyle. What else? I'd say various things like, you know, we, um, we were just very mindful. We'd plan our travels intentionally. At, least, tw advice. at least 12 months ahead, we were planning how we would travel, which meant, you know, saving properly for that travel to happen. Mm. Um, but there were various little tweaks in our lives. I mean, a good example as well is, is where we bought our home. Mm. So we chose to buy a house in a commuter town, which meant we didn't buy it in central London or in zone one to four in London, which is very, very expensive. 
We moved out a bit more, which meant that we borrowed a lot less money and therefore didn't incur as much debt as possible. But the key point is that when you add up all these small changes you make in your lifestyle, they add up to a big overall impact on your finances. Absolutely. You guys grew the gap between the income and the expenses in both ways. You guys increased your income. You found ways to decrease your expenses. Now, I'm hearing some harmony in this in this conversation, you two talking about this plan together. Were there any difficult times during these seven years? And how did you guys get through those? So, yeah, I mean, there were difficulties. But the thing is, is that we actually did dream together from the start. So even before we got married, when we were planning our wedding, we also created a 10-year, 10-year plan. plan. Mm-hmm. And this is whilst we were, you know, chilling on the beach. It was a beautiful setting. We didn't have to ha- worry about, you know, paying bills or cooking or anything like that we had the freedom to just be, um, dream together and part of that um, 10 year plan was to pay off the mortgage mm-hmm. in 10 years so working backwards i guess helped us to stay on the same page whenever we had disagreements so one of the disagreements was i didn't agree to the 50 pounds sure. budget at, to start with i thought it was ridiculous but then I just challenged myself eventually after I got bored of Ken, like slightly, you know, making those snide comments. Oh, you spent (laughs) that much on the food shop today, babe. Um, I got a bit, yeah, I thought, you know what? I'm going to prove you wrong. And I challenged myself because at the end of the day, the way we saw it was, is what we're doing moving us closer to our goal or further away? And that helped me to just, you know, get on the same page, Mm. helped us both to get on the same page. Would it have a disagreement? Yeah, there are things like holidays. You know, I might spend a bit more than we might have almost planned for on the holiday, whereas you might be like, actually, don't, you know, don't uh, book the upgrade in the hotel room. Yeah, yeah. Maybe just stick to, you know, the more basic, you know, option. Which so meant what, that our children were closer to bit, us. Yeah, a bit more cramped in. <laughs> we didn't have that privacy. You know, we didn't have the privacy. Wanted. You know, so there were yeah. things like that that, Although they were, they seem insignificant. Were pretty significant because they have an economic cost. Uh, but then, to be honest with you, they didn't. You know, they didn't stop the long-term goal we had. Yeah, yeah. I guess this is just one of the things that couples, you know, once in a while disagree on. Yeah, uh, absolutely. But for the most part, for the most part, part we were. Yeah, I love it. I love it. I mean, that that's a big part of what you value and what's important yeah. to you. And then coming together to have those conversations, and it seems like. Those conversations are a cornerstone of your relationship. You guys were planning together oh, yeah. at the beginning of your relationship. You're planning throughout the process. Otherwise, this this would not work. Talk talk to us about how you celebrated this mortgage free <laughs> moment, or how things have changed uh, since you've become mortgage free. Talk to us about that. All right. So I'll tell you now. So when we became mortgage free, it wasn't a big explosion. Well, what, what do I mean by that? When it happened, we were more in shock than anything else. Yeah, because. <laughs> Because it was just like, it felt very weird because you spend all these years building up and I'd love to be able to tell you like, you know, you know, the heavens opened up and all the constellations and the stars and the angels were celebrating. No, none of that happened. It was literally like, oh, we've just made our last payment. And what should we do? It was very, very weird. How do you celebrate? Like, what do you do? We did it over the phone and we didn't get any congratulations or like, wow, guys, this is a great deal. It was just like, oh, okay, payment's gone through. Yeah. Really? Yeah, the bank was just no, like, well yeah. Well done, or, but I don't yeah. want to be more annoyed with us than anything. Cause... But then <laughs> gradually over time, it began to sink in, you know, because I think there was a delay between the, the final payment and the realization of the magnitude of what we've actually done. You know, because then you started to notice the reality, like I'd go for a walk, for example, and when I'd walk back and I'd stare at the house and go, wow, this is our mortgage-free house. You know, that felt good looking at that and being able to do that. And we still do that today. It's like, wow, welcome to your mortgage-free house. <laughs> every time we come home. Every, every time we come home, we're like, welcome, babe. Welcome to your mortgage-free home. You know? <laughs> I love it. Yeah. That's incredible. So, so, and then over time, we've, we've gradually celebrated. So, you know, going away, for example. So the celebration wasn't like a, a, a singular event. Yeah. It's more of a lifestyle improvement mm-hmm. and overall quality of life improvement that has come from the result of paying off the mortgage. I love it. Now, has that changed any of your working situation? You guys were oh, yes. in the corporate America. You, you maybe talk about that. Your long-term plan was to not do that in your 60s. How has that changed yeah. your work situation? Do you want to go first? Then I'll share mine. 
Um, yeah, so I, I, I left the corporate world before you in 2000. And, no, no, no. Yeah. Well, you left in 2012 when you I got left pregnant. in 2012 when I got pregnant, and that was mm-hmm. to start a, a business, a, a childcare, mm-hmm. which you call it a daycare. Yeah. Um, and I did that for seven years. But in 2019, I left that to work on the Humble Penny full time because it had now grown from just a passion project to something that was actually tricky to juggle with the business, the child, yeah. children, marriage, life and all of that. Mm-hmm. Whereas you, you're a different story. Yeah, so I had a 14-year career as a chartered accountant, uh, worked my way up from training to become a chief financial officer, very well paid, really, it all the perks. However, when uh, the pandemic hit in 2020, it all collided. So mm-hmm. I had a board level role, I had you know our business or, or side hustle doing really well or taking off. I had my job, which was very demanding, and working from home, which is very tough. Then I had the idea of homeschooling our two children during the pandemic. Then there was the mental challenges, then this marriage. There's so many things happening that we just thought, look, we've been working towards becoming financially independent, and we're now there. However, leaving your corporate role isn't that easy, particularly when you get paid a fixed salary every month and it's very you know it's a nice to get you know and you're used to getting that income Mm -hmm. uh, but it's the identity that your career gives you you know i was used to my linkedin title and you know all those very shiny things and all the perks but then i let that go uh in 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 april 2020 because it all just collided and it was a good opportunity for us to say well actually we've got this far we don't have a mortgage where, you know, we've, been, we've got us, you know, lots of savings. Mm-hmm. Why don't we have a go at doing something else? So that's when I took the leap to basically fix on running the Humble Penny full-time with, with Mary um, as an alternative, I, I guess, career or yeah. adventure. Yeah. I love it. That's incredible. So how, how hours-wise, how, mm. how has that changed your, your working time oh, uh, doing, doing what you're doing now versus what you used to do? So... <sighs> What I used to do, I, I'm going to talk about that first. So I would typically leave home at, say, 7.30 a.m. And on a good day, I'd be back home at 7.30 p.m. or 7 p.m. on a good day. On a bad day, it could be 10 p.m., 10 p.m. 11 p.m., right? Yeah. Or even later, sometimes after midnight, right? That's how, that's how it was. Um, whereas what I do now on a good week, I work six day, uh, six hours a day, four days a week, Monday to Thursday. So I work 9am to 3pm and then I stop, uh, on a really tough week. I might have a few calls in the evening, you know, I might have a workshop or something that I'm delivering or a podcast or whatever that needs to be on. Then I might do that in the evening, but the worst case scenario is I still have Friday off, Saturday off, Sunday off, and then most of my afternoon off in my new reality. So I'm happier. I'm less stressed. I'm like, I just, I'm buzzing a lot more. Yeah. I love what I'm doing. You know, I'm available for my wife. I'm available yeah. for my kids. I'm, ava- school run. I'm available for myself. Yeah. yeah. I get to do the school run. I get to do all the things that I used to dream of doing. Yeah. But yeah. also you didn't mention that we take the whole month of August off to travel. Every year. Um, as well as a smaller like holidays in between that time. Yeah. So like a, a weekend here or a week holiday, you know, in like the months leading up to the long August month. Yeah. So we get a lot of time. So we end, up to, we end up traveling probably for about eight to 12 weeks a year, something like that. Um, when you add up all the various bits. So it's been a total lifestyle change. I mean, yeah. I, honestly, I wish someone, if there's a way you could work out potential life expectancy changes that happens from the less stress, less worry, less mental, you know, I don't know, arithmetic and all the stuff you worry about when you have, you know, big debts and, various bits to worry about. So mm. it's definitely made a huge difference 
uh, in the quality of our marriage, mm. the quality of our family life, and so much more. So with if you had your mortgage today, this wouldn't be possible. Oh, no, 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 no. I mean, we'd still be doing some of those things, yeah. you know, like we'd be traveling once in a while, but would be a, would there be so much more restriction is the best way to put it. Yeah. And also, I wouldn't have left my career. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Because I look, when you have a mortgage, it's, it, it makes you more risk averse. That's in my personal opinion. Mm. Uh, because, and I know this from my parents, because my dad was always like, oh man, I, you know, I, I don't really like my job very much, but I can't just leave because like, I've got this mortgage to pay. Yeah. Right. But then when you don't have the mortgage, what's interesting about it, because one big argument I get from people is this, oh, well, maybe you should be just investing in property or real estate. And, you know, now you can do those things, but nothing stops you doing them even when you've got your mortgage paid off on your home. Like you can do, you can do so much more. In fact, your capacity to take risk is a lot higher. Yeah. And you're doing it from a place of safety, you know? Mm -hmm. So I just think for us personally, and it wouldn't be for everybody, Becoming mortgage free has been like life changing beyond belief. Yeah. I love that. I love that. Now you you talked about your immigrant immigrant background and mm. having this be a new experience for your family. Talk to us about generational wealth plans for your kids. What does this mortgage free situation mean for them? What does it mean for their future? I love that question. So I guess, yeah, one of the main things it does for them is it, it creates that level of security for them. And it's just a great foundation also for them. So we co-invest with our children and we have time to actually explain to them, you know, the meaning of investing. They get to look at their investment portfolio. You know, we get to explain to them, these are what, these are your investments. You know, this is how much it's made. It's gone down a bit, but don't worry about it because we're looking for the long term. You'll see how your investments will grow over time. Um, so I guess it's just that knowledge that we've given them and just that understanding that you can do things differently. You don't have to be so much of a consumer, but you can actually do things differently that will give you a solid foundation for yourself and, you know, a, a future that means that you don't have to stress or work until you're 65. But yeah. Just yeah. I'll just add to that. Like Mary and I are, if you go and look at the stats of using just randomly black families in the UK, right? Just using that as an example, we are uh, very, very unusual from a, statistic perspective because first of all home ownership rates for black households in the uk are so low so low yeah. firstly let alone the proportion that are mortgage free right so so for mary and i from a legacy perspective this is set a really important like example for our children to say look you can do this yeah. right because you've seen your parents do it you can do this and you can do better Right? That's yeah, the first thing, exactly. right? And and secondly, because we've removed a lot of financial burden from our lives, it's created an indirect opportunity for our children because it means more of our money can now go towards investing in things that will help to further their lives. I'll give you an example. Languages, right? Our children are learning Japanese. They're learning Spanish. They're learning our Igbo language, which is our cultural language. They're learning Yoruba. They're learning other languages they're doing football, they're doing, they've got part of the chess club, they're part of various things that they're doing that means that we're giving them a much better quality of life at this stage, mm. right? We're exposing them to so many opportunities for them to thrive and acquire the skills, acquire the mindset that they need to be able to navigate a lot of uncertain challenges that will come in the future. But better than all this, were available as a couple. Mm, because a lot of people, you know, a lot of, I use men as an example. Traditionally, men are working. They're, you know, out there. You know, this is traditionally, they're out there trying to provide. A lot of men say, oh, I'm providing. So therefore, it's okay not to be there for my kids that much because I'm providing the money. And, you know, when in actual fact, what your children want is you. Yeah. They want you. They want to play with you. They want to hang out with you. They want to learn from you. So for me, part of that legacy is I'm there. You see what I'm saying? Available. I'm available. Yeah. Like if there's a school show, I show up. If there's a, a, a end of term event, awards evening or afternoon, I'm there. If there's like a parents, you know, coffee morning, I'm there. Yeah. If, whatever it is, I show up, you know, and that is priceless. Yeah. 
Yeah. I, I, be, I believe that's the evolution of the new father. Absolutely. And I yeah. think you are giving us a great example of that, uh, Ken and Mary, for all of your hard work as parents and showing them an example of generational wealth, not just meaning money, but yeah. knowledge and time yeah. as well yes. with, with their parents. So thank you both so much for sharing your story. You have a new book called Financial Joy yes. and a great website called The Humble Penny. Tell people where to go to learn more about this and connect with you. Thank you. So Financial Joy is our debut book, is a Sunday Times bestseller, I should say, which is the UK equivalent of the New York Times bestseller. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, the book if, it effectively is a 10-week plan. So it's not just got chapters in it, it's got week-by-week plans. Everything from, you know, working on your relationship with money, dis, you know, overcoming behavioral biases, learning to banish your debt, learning to invest, planning for retirement, you know, legacy planning and all those things. So week by week, this book effectively, as we say on the title, is a 10 week plan to help you banish debt, grow your money and unlock financial freedom. Yeah. But if you want this book, you can get it from all major um, retailers like Amazon, and it comes out in Barnes the US. Barnes and Noble. Barnes and Noble. It's actually officially coming out in August in the US. Yes. So, um, but you can access there. the audio version right now, anytime. Uh, it's on Audible yes. and yes. that sort of yes. thing. But it's, honestly, it's so much better. Well, I, I think what people, what we've noticed from the UK release, which has been phenomenal, by the way, is that people get both the Audible version and the physical copy because it's a it's a week by week plan. So. You need to write in a book and that sort of thing. So yeah, available everywhere. I love it. I love it. Thank you both so much. I look forward to sending people your way to check out Financial Joy. And again, the hum humble penny as well. Ken and Mary, yes. thank you so much for your time today. Thank, thank you, you so Andy. Much, Andy. Appreciate it. It's been great. Want to see how extra principal payments can make you mortgage free faster? Well, check out our free mortgage payoff calculator on our website at marriagekidsandmoney.com. You can access it using the links below and insert a little bit of information. Hit the calculate button and see how close you are to mortgage freedom. Mm -hmm.